The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash ZJH860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. In the following certified educational activity, experts in eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyanchiitis or EGPA discuss the pathophysiology and diagnosis of the disease, as well as strategies for treatment. Doctors Michael Wexler and Peter Merkel are joined by Linda Delacatera to discuss the impact EGPA has had on her quality of life. Hi, I'm Mike Wexler from National Jewish Health in Denver, Colorado. Welcome to this educational activity on relieving the burden of EGPA, examining the latest advances in diagnosis and treatment. So let's get started. Eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis, or EGPA, was formerly known as Churg Strauss syndrome. It's an eosinophilic disorder that was described in the 1950s by Jacob Churg and Lottie Strauss that can affect multiple organ systems. EGPA is characterized by moderate to severe asthma, peripheral blood eosinophilia, mononeuropathy or polyneuropathy, pulmonary infiltrates, paranasal sinus abnormalities, and extravascular eosinophils or eosinophilic vasculitis. ANCA, or antineutrophil cytoplasmic antibodies, can be present in 30 to 40% of all patients. EGPA equally affects men and women, with a mean age at onset of 48 years and a mean age at diagnosis of 55 years. This shows that patients often go undiagnosed for many years. Although our understanding of what predicts disease onset remains poor, EGPA is likely the result of a complex interaction of genetic and environmental factors leading to an inflammatory response whose principal players are eosinophils, T cells, and B cells. EGPA has an estimated prevalence of about 14 cases per million individuals, and there are about 5,000 people in the United States suffering from EGPA right now. This prevalence, however, may be underestimated due to poor physician recognition of this entity, large numbers of patients who continue to be treated with systemic steroids for what's perceived to be severe asthma that's really EGPA, and new drugs that are able to quell EGPA symptoms, such as high doses of inhaled corticosteroids. How EGPA is defined and diagnosed may depend on the perspective of a specialist. For example, pulmonologists will often first see eosinophilia and asthma. Rheumatologists will first see the ANCA, vasculitis, and end organ features. And allergists and immunologists may first see asthma and or sinusitis and recognize EGPA when they work up the asthma and identify eosinophils. But this disease can present anywhere. So it's important for every subspecialty to recognize it. Hematologists and infectious disease specialists may see it because of the eosinophilia. Dermatologists can see it because of the rash. Cardiologists may see it because of myocardial involvement. And gastroenterologists and nephrologists may see it because of the effects on those organ systems. It's really important for different treating specialists to work together to help establish a diagnosis and help identify an appropriate treatment plan for every patient. It's also important to evaluate what else could be going on in this patient. Some of the differential diagnoses that need to be considered include other vasculitides, chronic eosinophilic pneumonia, and hyper eosinophilic syndromes. Eosinophilia, however, is essential for a diagnosis of EGPA, along with asthma and some degree of extra pulmonary involvement. And ANCA testing can be helpful, along with CT imaging and electromyography. When we come back, I'll be joined by Dr. Peter Merkel, who will lend his expertise to a discussion of EGPA diagnosis and the novel and emerging treatment options available for the management of EGPA. So stay tuned, and we'll be right back. Welcome back. Joining me today is Dr. Peter Merkel, a rheumatologist from the University of Pennsylvania, where he's director of the Vasculitis Center. Please welcome Dr. Merkel. Peter, great to see you. Mike, good to see you again. So we've been talking about eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis, EGPA. You're a rheumatologist, I'm a pulmonologist, so let's talk about EGPA from each of our perspectives. So tell me 
how you perceive eGPA, how you make a diagnosis. Let's talk a little bit about that. So eGPA, as you know, is one of the three ANCA-associated vasculitides. So it's a type of vasculitis, inflammation of the blood vessels, and so much more. So as I like to say about vasculitis, there's more to vasculitis than just vasculitis. It affects almost every organ, and it can often be organ-threatening and life-threatening. eGPA is unique, and it almost always is associated with asthma, 90 plus percent of patients. Usually it precedes the other manifestations of disease. And there's eosinophilia, increase in blood eosinophils, often penetrating into tissues, causing all sorts of issues. So, you know, we see patients who often have had asthma, sometimes adult onset only, sometimes for a short period of time, sometimes for years before something else happens, or someone thinks about eGPA, and then they get manifestations that could include sinusitis, nasal polyps, which you could say, well, that goes along with asthma and atopy, maybe that's not so weird, but then they get high eosinophils, also associated with asthma, but then they can get rashes that are vasculitic or other inflammatory infiltrates in the lung that's not infectious and are often are very responsive to prednisone, and then even more seriously, neuropathy or, or kidney disease or other manifestations that can be very troubling and very problematic, especially heart disease and cardiomyopathy. You may see patients presenting in a different fashion than I do, but together we see the full spectrum. Yeah, I, I think usually I see the patients who have asthma and eosinophilia who end up developing vasculitis. And I, I suspect that you end up seeing the patients who have vasculitis who happen to have asthma and eosinophilia, and that's how you make the diagnosis. I, I would agree, and I think both of us at specialty centers are concerned that patients often get missed by any of the different doctors that they might see for various issues. And I think what we hope to do is increase awareness that if you have a patient with asthma who is beginning to develop these other manifestations, or if a patient who with neuropathy or cardiomyopathy and have hints of this, that you'll at least think about eGPA. Yeah, exactly. So what are some of the things that are in the differential diagnosis for eGPA? And I see the patients who have the myeloproliferative variants of hypereosinophilic syndrome and the lymphocytic variants of hypereosinophilic syndrome. Uh, and then patients who have chronic eosinophilic pneumonia, which can present a little bit like eGPA, in that many of those patients have asthma, many of those patients have sinus disease, many of those patients have pulmonary infiltrates and eosinophilia. And so it's almost like eGPA. So what are some of the types of diseases, entities that you see, and how do you differentiate between eGPA? Yeah, so I think in my practice, of, in our vasculitis center and as a rheumatologist, we often see them after they've been at least have a hint that they have vasculitis or something else. But I agree, we really worry about what are we missing? What hyper eosinophilic syndromes are we missing? And then we'll often work with an allergist or pulmonologist, immunologist to help us sort that out. Once we get a sense that it's not a parasitic infection, it's not a malignant eosinophilic disorder or a vaguer form of hyper eosinophilia, we then need to differentiate it from other causes of vasculitis, especially GPA and MPA. And of course, the asthma and the eosinophils really help you separate it. Um, patients with eGPA often present, once they get beyond the, va the asthma and sinus issues, they can be fairly dramatic, have a pretty bad initial exacerbation, and then either often get better, and then the asthma and the sinus and the other stuff becomes the major problem that drives things. But relapse is more common than people think and nagging ongoing problems, which can be quite severe. And so we do need to make sure that we're not missing these other disorders. And then as the disease goes on, our hope, of course, is that our patients are doing fine, but they can develop either other problems or complications of therapy. And I think the things we most worry about are infections because the drugs we use suppress the immune system. So we, in terms of making a diagnosis, what type of workup do you do uh, in terms of establishing a diagnosis of eGPA, and then once you've established a, a diagnosis of eGPA, how do you monitor your patients and how do you follow up on your patients? I think the most important aspect of making a diagnosis is what I call the patient biopsy, which is talk to the patient, get a history, go through the chart, because often years before or months before, they'll have hints, they'll have the sinus, they'll have the polyps, they'll have the, the quote, pneumonia, that didn't get better with antibiotics, but someone gave them glucocorticoids, steroids, and they got better. So I think a full history. And then if we're thinking it might be eGPA, I think you really need to make sure you're not missing some of the major manifestations. Obviously, a full neurologic exam is part of your full physical examination. 
But you want, we, will, we will check for ANCA because as you know, 40% of patients are ANCA positive, almost always with antimyeloperoxidase, MPO, ANCA. And those patients have a different track. They tend to more likely to have renal disease and less likely to have the heart disease. And we might, be, might change our treatments based if they're ANCA positive or not. It's also very helpful diagnostically. If we're thinking strongly about EGPA, we'll get a CT scan of the head, which gets your mastoids, the sinuses, the orbits, and a CT of the, of the chest. And I think these CTs almost always don't need to have contrast. I don't know if you agree. And you're looking for masses and nodules and infiltrates. We're going to do a urinalysis, a serum creatinine, obviously a CBC and, and a serum eosinophils. And we're going to, after you've done your full fit history and physical, and we're going to try to peach it, patch it all together. If there's skin lesions, a biopsy can often be useful. Um, and I think you really want to go back and get a sense of what their course has been. Often patients, by the time they're being considered to have eGPA, have already received glucocorticoids multiple times, antibiotics, and other things. So do you check a troponin on your patients? Do you check echocardiogram? When do you use cardiac MRI? I will get an echocardiogram on any patient I think either I know has eGPA or I suspect moderately strong has eGPA. You don't want to miss the cardiomyopathy, which is often an early manifestation of disease. 30, 40% of patients can have clinically apparent cardiomyopathy and maybe more not so clinically apparent. We get a baseline EKG. Cardiac MRI, interested in your thoughts, is, I wouldn't say controversial, it's emerging technology. I think we get it when we're not sure about the level of activity or we're worried about other causes of cardiomyopathy. So the patient that comes in the hospital with heart failure and you're beginning to think about eGPA, that may be helpful as you gather evidence. The patient who known have eGPA, not sure it necessarily adds more. Some would argue that it's actually another way non-invasively to follow patient's disease. What do you think? Yeah, so I think we're still learning about the sensitivity and the specificity of some of the newer imaging modalities and what their role is. I think it's important to follow it, certainly in people who have uh, active disease and have uh, reduction in their ejection fraction, for instance, those patients will all usually get a cardiac MRI and follow it to see if there's any hint of active inflammation going on. What, what about the role of biopsies in general? How often do you biopsy? Is it necessary to have a biopsy in order to uh, establish a firm diagnosis of EGP, or, or is it more of a clinical diagnosis? Well, I think it is. I mean, as you know, the prior name was Churchill syndrome, implying that it's not a specific disease. I think we're learning more about this, but it is rather syndromic. So I agree with you that it's generally a clinical diagnosis. However, I think biopsies serve two important reasons. One, you often get a biopsy to make sure you're not missing something else, infection, drug toxicity, or another complete disease. Those biopsies, I think, skin, if it's purpura and you can see actual vasculitis, that's very helpful. Uh, other, but many of the skin lesions, as you know, are not purpuric, and so they get other things. How, how do you follow your patients, and are there lab tests that you get on a regular yeah. basis as you follow patients? How do I follow patients? Well, I think the most important thing is they need to be seen regularly. They need to have an ongoing dialogue with the patient so that you can see how they're doing. We follow their asthma sort of in the usual fashion. I'll defer to you to discuss that in detail, given your expertise. We follow their asthma. We follow their upper airway disease, often in collaboration with, I'm a rheumatologist, collaboration with a pulmonologist and or an ENT physician. But we follow patients regularly clinically. We're certainly going to follow their laboratory studies, mostly to monitor for the drug toxicities that could happen. You want to make sure you're not missing kidney disease, especially in the patients who are ANCA positive, because that can be silent. And I think imaging is very useful. I, if there's initial infiltrative disease, I want to make sure I've gotten a follow-up image to reestablish the baseline so that you can see if things changing. And then you brought up the issue of cardiac disease. And I think once a patient has established cardiomyopathy, you, we're working with a cardiologist and there is serial imaging, usually echocardiogram to follow along. Yeah, so just as a pulmonologist, I also follow pulmonary function testing. Yes, okay. <laughs> um, and uh, I think it's important to evaluate because asthma, is a, it, it, it's a, a controversial but important part of the disease from a pulmono pulmonology perspective, from an allergy perspective. That's what we tend to see. And so, you know, we will follow lung function tests, which can vary a little bit with disease activity. Well, my our pulmonologists are right next door, so I we get a lot of pulmonary function tests. And I think you would agree, pro we'll talk about treatment in a moment, but probably one of the cardinal aspects of treatment is 
Don't under treat the asthma. Treat the asthma. Treat the asthma. Yeah. So one of the, for, from my perspective, in terms of following patients, I think one of the key things that I do is uh, really I, I want to identify and tell patients to be vigilant for any new signs or symptoms, and you know they they should look out for any new GI manifestation, any new neuropathy, any yeah. worsening disease. And then, you know, and I tell them to call me right away because even once they're diagnosed, I want to know, make sure that there isn't disease activity going on. Yeah, I, I say patients are the early warning system. They're the first ones to know if something new is happening. And I agree with you. You'd rather have them call us. That's our job to interpret what's going on. And sometimes we, we can just make reassure on the phone and sometimes we're concerned and say, come on in. So I agree. Any new symptoms that, you know, really we want to hear about it. Because this is a strange disease that can do all sorts of things. And, the, and it's important to remember that just because a patient had A, B, and C when he or she was diagnosed doesn't mean they can't get X, Y, and Z later. Exactly, exactly. So we're going to talk about treatment in a moment. But before focusing on that, I want to talk a little bit about the pathophysiology. So that, that'll sort of let us get to the point of how we should treat and targeted approaches. So. We know from the name eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis that eosinophils play an important role. And uh, eosinophils are a key cell. They're an important white blood cell, and they have a lot of inflammatory mediators, including eosinophilic cationic protein, eosinophil-derived neurotoxin, major basic protein that can get into the tissue and cause inflammation. But it's also an ANCA-associated disease. So let's talk a little bit about ANCA. What, tell me, tell me what, what, what the general practitioner needs to know about anti-neutrophil cytoplasmic antibodies. So ANCA, of course, are one of the most useful tests in medicine these days from an antibody standpoint. It is a very specific test in the right setting with the right pretest probability. It is very useful diagnostically for that spectrum of vasculitis called ANCA-associated vasculitis. Again, 40% of patients, 30 to 40% of patients at EGPA will have MPO positive ANCA. Those patients tend to have renal disease, not to have cardiac disease, and we tend to treat them more like our other patients with ankle associated vasculitis than those without. But from a pathophysiology standpoint, there is mounting evidence that ANCA is at least partially causing this disease or triggering the disease. Its exact role is still controversial, but there are very good animal models, especially for MPO positive ANCA, that it can cause glomerulonephritis and other in inflammation. So it's part of the disease process. You talked about eosinophils. They can also trigger other other uh, chemokines and signaling. So it can anchor activation at the level of the vessel, complement becomes active. And I think that like most autoimmune and systemic inflammatory diseases, there are multiple pathways at play. And although we like to think that we know exactly what's going on, it's almost always more complicated. Uh, I agree. I think it's very complex. <laughs> and you know, there's a role, a role of eosinophils, but also probably neutrophils play a role. And I think that, that, that we're still learning about all the different mechanisms of play. And there's probably a genetic component as well as an environmental right. component as well. And so we're still gaining a lot of information. And I think that's why we need to do more studies in these patients. So we've talked about pathophysiology. We've talked about presentation disease. Let's focus a little bit on treatment. So what's your general approach to patients with EGPA from a management and treatment perspective? Well, unfortunately or fortunately, depending how you look at it, the mainstay of therapy still remains glucocorticoids. And so prednisone and its various cousins are used incredibly often. And this, of course, because they work. So they, they work very quickly to treat upper airway and lower airway disease. They can stop the process of vasculitis in various organs, organs very quickly. But they can be ravaging. As I like to say to patients, aside from the mania and the insomnia and the, uh, and the <laughs> osteoporosis, osteonecrosis, the cataracts, glaucoma, the hypertension, the infections, the diabetes mellitus, and all the other problems, what's not to love? And yeah. so, two-edged sword. We, it's the best, they're the best drugs we have, they're the worst drugs we have. They work quickly, but I think you and I have both been involved in research to try to find new medications that can reduce the burden of glucocorticoids. Additionally, in some patients, they don't work enough. You can't keep people, you don't want to keep people on high dose glucocorticoids, and you need other drugs to help keep the disease from coming back, from keep them in remission, remission maintenance, and from relapsing. Additionally, though, for reasons that we still haven't figured out, many patients, no matter what else they're on, often require at least low dose of glucocorticoids, sometimes not so low, just to maintain the disease. And I would say it's especially asthma, 
and the and the sinus and polyp disease. Yeah, so so I think treating the asthma and treating the sinus disease is really important, and it's also important to involve other specialists as well, ear, nose, and throat doctors, allergists from an asthma and allergy perspective. But then whatever other disease manifestations may be occurring, I think you need to involve those physicians, whether it's gastroenterologists, nephrologists, neurologists, neurologists, uh, pain specialists, hematologists. I think all these kinds of specialists can be involved in the care. So and let's talk a little bit about uh, therapy. Um, so you mentioned corticosteroids. Uh, again, uh, the good and the bad uh, about corticosteroids. But what do you do when corticosteroids aren't working or if you can't get the dose of corticosteroids lower? So I think we often, depends on how the patient is presenting either initially or their relapse. For patients with fairly severe disease, especially central or peripheral neuropathy, cardiomyopathy, kidney disease, or bad GI disease, or other things you think are very serious, we're usually going to add another immunosuppressive agent from the beginning on top of the glucocorticoids. The idea is as you taper the glucocorticoids, they have a soft landing and patients will stay in remission. Um, as you know, there haven't been a lot of good trials. There have been some. Uh, we were part of an important one that you led. There are about immunosuppressive agents. We use a variety of different drugs. For patients who are ANCA positive, there's increasing experience with the use of rituximab early on in the course of that disease, in addition to glucocorticoids. Um, for patients with severe cardiac disease, bad neuropath neuropathy, many physicians, many of us and others, will use cyclophosphamide still, at least for a few months, and then go to another drug such as azathioprine or methotrexate. Um, there is evidence that these can be useful, but there's some question as to how useful they are in certain settings. And the newest class of medications that, as you know, we're using are the IL-5 inhibitors. Uh, as you mentioned, that IL-5 is one of the cytokines that may be triggering and may be involved in the pathophysiology. So this includes mepolizumab and other agents that are out there now for eosinophilic asthma. And of course, this is an eosinophilic asthma in eGPA. But in the trial that you did lead and r ran, we were able to show that mepolizumab is useful for patients with at least mild to moderate disease in helping to control some of, the some of the manifestations of eGPA, especially the asthma and the sinus and some of the upper airway symptoms, and it was able to reduce the total amount of glucocorticoids, which is very important for patients. Yeah, in, in that study, we demonstrated about a 50% reduction in the relapse rate in patients with eGPA, and also about a 50% reduction in uh, corticosteroid dosing in those patients. So I think really important outcomes for many of our patients with eGPA. Uh, it's also exciting that there are also a few new uh, anti-IL-5 therapies that are in development, f currently approved for asthma, like venralizumab and reslizumab. And some preliminary data has been presented at some national meetings suggesting that there's efficacy of those therapies as well in terms of improving outcomes, in, pr in terms of reducing exacerbations and improving uh, and reducing steroid dosing in those patients. I mean, I think it's an exciting class of medications that we're using increasingly. The safety profile is really quite good. And I wouldn't underestimate how important it can be for patients to be reduced their prednisone dose, even if it's from the 12 to 15 milligram level per day down to five, five to seven. That's a big difference. It's a big toxicity difference, and it's really important. And additionally, what we see, as you know, is that patients over time, it's not just that they're on a dose of prednisone, it's that they have these relapses, often several times a year, especially of asthma or sinusitis and other problems. And when you really begin to see, they get a couple of weeks of high-dose glucocorticoids, come down again to their usual level, and again and again. When you add it all up, it's a significant amount of glucocorticoids. If we can flatten out that pattern and have people have fewer exacerbations and stay on even their low dose, I think that's a win. Yeah, so it seems like the key outcomes that we're trying to uh, treat in these patients are reducing corticosteroids, reducing relapses, and reducing the long-term systemic manifestations of the disease. I agree. And they're, so these class of drugs are very interesting, and there will be future ones. There's a lot of research being done now that I think can apply to eGPA. And our goal is to find treatments that can eliminate glucocorticoids, keep people safe, and hopefully cure the disease. Yeah, these are exciting times for these patients because in the past, there were no real options for them. Yeah, so this has been a great discussion. I think we've had a lot of uh, important information discussed about eGPA. Um, and 
When we come back, Dr. Merkel and I will be joined by a patient who is living with eGPA and will further explore real-world considerations in managing these patients. So stay tuned and we'll be right back. Welcome back. Building on our previous discussion, Dr. Merkel and I will now be joined by a patient with eGPA and we'll take a closer look at some of the practical considerations when it comes to managing these patients. Please welcome Ms. Linda Delicatera. Linda, thank you so much for joining us. Great to see you. So Linda, Peter and I have been discussing the manifestations of eGPA and the history of eGPA, how to make a diagnosis of eGPA. You've been living with eGPA. Tell us a little bit about your journey. How, how old were you when you were diagnosed and how did they make a diagnosis of eGPA? Um, I was diagnosed when I was 47 years old. Um, and the diagnosis was uh, arrived at um, because first I started out with the adult onset asthma. Um, and then I had some chest x-rays done which showed some ground glass opacities in my lungs, uh, hyper eosinophilia. Um, and then right before I was diagnosed, I showed up uh, with some skin lesions uh, on my body. And so I think they sort of put all of that together and came up with the diagnosis. Well, over what period of time did that occur? How long did it take to make a diagnosis of eGPA? So the diagnosis, uh, took about 15 months. The adult onset asthma started um, when I was 46, and then it was uh, about 15 months later that all of these other things came into play. Wow. So that's pretty common, actually. People, there's often a gap between the asthma. It can be weeks, can be months, can even be years. Mm -hmm. Did you start having other manifestations of disease even after your first course? neuropathy or polyps or things like that? Yes, actually um, a few months after the asthma started, I started having some sinus abnormalities and actually had a surgery to strip the sinuses, um, which was unsuccessful. And they couldn't figure it out why, so I was seeing the EN folks in ENT at that point. Um, and then later I did develop some sort of you know, on and off tingling in my hands and feet. Wow. Um, it didn't last for long periods, but there was sort of that numbness and tingling. The neuropathy that we've exactly. talked about. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a the type of symptom that we always want patients to report because it's often ignored or even by physicians and by patients, and it's really important because Fortunately, in your case, it didn't lead to other problems, but sometimes it leads to more serious neuropathy and inability to move hands and feet properly. So it sounds like you've been through quite a journey uh, with your eGPA experience. So they, they made a diagnosis, and um, first of all, how did you feel about that? Were you nervous? Were you anxious? And then how did they treat you? eGPA had been mentioned, so I did my little bit of research and uh, read about it, and. Yeah, it was a pretty scary diagnosis. Um, I was initially treated with corticosteroids, followed by um, cyclophosphamide at the beginning. Um, after about six months of that, I was switched over to azathioprine. Um, and that treatment continued for quite a few years. It wasn't until um, pretty recently that I was taken off the azathioprine and switched to mycophenolate yep. um, and also began the methylismab injections. Wow. So tell me, why did they switch you? And tell us about your experience with the initial treatments, with the steroids, with the cyclophosphamide, with the azathioprine. Tell us, the, the, you know, the good, the bad, the ugly about those treatments. Um, the good is that I'm alive. Uh, the bad and the ugly, there's a long, long list of, of those. Um, so the prednisone, starting with that, there were a lot of side effects. There was weight gain. Um, I developed that lovely facial hair. Mm. Um, uh, skin thinning from being on it a long time. Um, oh my goodness. Were you worried about your bones? bones? Uh, 
good question. Yes. Yes. So I have developed osteopenia um, from the long-term steroid use. I do have a DEXA scan every other year uh, to sort of monitor that. So that was definitely a side effect. The cyclophosphamide was really rough. Uh, that was a very, very rough six months. Sure. I lost all of my hair. Um, so I was fat, bald, sweaty like crazy from the prednisone, I presume, um, and generally feeling terrible. Um, the azathioprine, once I switched uh, over to that, I didn't notice any side effects from that. I think in my blood work there were some changes, uh, but didn't really notice anything. So the, as you mentioned, thankfully you're alive and you're doing yes. quite well now, it appears. Prednisone, as we said, is the best drug we have, is the worst drug we have. Mm -hmm. Would you agree that efforts to try to find new drugs to get people off prednisone is perhaps one of the most important things we could do for EGPF. Absolutely, absolutely. W what's yeah. been your experience since you've been on mepolizumab? How often do you take it and, uh, and uh, have you tolerated it well? I've tolerated it very well. I began in March of 2018 receiving monthly injections of 300 milligrams. And honestly, I've not noticed any side effects at all. Um, my prednisone dose is, is way down now to three milligrams. Um, what, were you, what, what dosing did you start at? You know, I, I, I know I was at 80 at one point uh, early in the journey. Um, you guys talked a little bit about people flaring, uh, particularly with asthma. Um, I do experience that several times a year, some more pulmonary has that, has that been better since the new medication treatment? It has, though I, I, that seems to be my, the weak link for me. I, I recently was exposed to some chemical fumes that caused a flare of the uh, asthma. Do you, do you take your inhalers? And I regular? don't, I never use the albuterol uh, rescue inhaler, um, but I do have the, uh, the daily maintenance there yeah. yeah yeah so um, you've cut back on your steroid dose it sounds like your asthma is relatively well controlled but you still have some players and that's to be expected you know none of these drugs are perfect in terms of eliminating all manifestations and so those are some of the things that, that we're still working on in terms of doing our research T tell us a little bit about the impact that EGPA has had on your social life, on your family life, and your general day-to-day -day well-being? Well, um, probably the biggest thing is the fatigue um, and sort of a general malaise feeling that seemed to come out of nowhere. They, they're very unpredictable. Um, I, I am still working. I work part-time. I have four children who are all grown now. Um, so at, at the time of diagnosis, which was almost 12 years ago now, um, that was difficult because the, the kids were pretty young. Um, so it took a toll on my family, um, it took a toll on my marriage, and um, you know, but for now, day to day, um, I wish someone had told me at the beginning that things were going to get so much better because, you know, I don't think about having EGPA every day. Well, that's, that's what we want. I think that you've yeah. done very well. You know, the fatigue you mentioned is very common, and I think we're learning research we and others have done. There's, there's a lot of fatigue in patients with chronic autoimmune and inflammatory diseases mm -hmm. that we need to pay more attention to as in medicine and patients, and it's not all people who have depression or fibromyalgia syndrome, other issues. There's something probably inherent in the disease that's causing this, and I think we're looking for treatments to be able to affect that as well. Peter and Linda, thank you so much for joining us for this discussion today. What we've discussed today is that a multidisciplinary team approach is essential in diagnosing eGPA. It's key to recognize the signs of eGPA and take note of high eosinophil counts and other important components of the lab workup and in collaborating in the treatment and long-term follow-up of patients with eGPA. We hope you found this discussion informative and useful for your practice.
Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash ZJH860. This educational activity is supported by an educational grant from GlaxoSmithKline. This activity has been jointly provided by the University of Cincinnati and PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education.